Okay, Jude is the second last book of the Bible. It is really small, one of the smallest books in the whole Bible, um, like 600 words, I think it is, very, very short book. It's a letter written by a guy called Jude, in fact. Well, actually, kind of. We'll look at that in a minute. Let me read it for you. We'll pray, and then we'll see what God might have for us. And again, um, let me just see who's in the room here. Okay, no one should get offended today. Uh, it's, it is a, let's just get into it, okay. Uh, Jude, chapter one, there's only one chapter, verse one. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, loved by God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some people, who were designated for this judgment long ago, have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. Now I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. In the same way, these people, relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority and slander glorious ones. You might be thinking, what does that mean to slander glorious ones? It's, like I said, it's going to be an interesting day. Yet when Michael the archangel was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these blaspheme anything they do not understand. And what they do understand by instinct, like irrational animals, by these things they are destroyed. <clears throat> Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, have plunged into Balaam's error for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion. These people are dangerous reefs at your love feasts as they eat with you without, without reverence. They're shepherds who only look after themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. They are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. It's about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, look, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. Those people are discontented grumblers living according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They, hold, they told you, in the end time, there will be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. <clears throat> These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the Spirit. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. We've got a lot of ground to travel today. Let's pray and see what God would have for us from Jude. And so, Father, we, we always need your help when we come to Scriptures. We don't want to just <clears throat> import our own understanding into things. But we want to gain the mind of Christ. And so help us, Father, as we hear your Scriptures, as your Spirit speaks to us, as I preach today, help us to certainly to grow in understanding, uh, but more so to grow in the likeness of your Son, Jesus, whose name we ask. Amen. Alrighty, so... Um, Jude is a tricky book. 
because there's a, there's a, and at the, on the other hand, it's an easy book. Uh, there are a lot of illustrations, there are a lot of uh, uh, allusions to things that have happened in the past. Lots of Old Testament characters and happenings you may have recognized. Some that the people in Jude's time would have known about historically that aren't in our scripture that he mentions. Like he talks about this guy Enoch who is in the Bible, but things that Enoch said that aren't recorded in our Bible, recorded in other historical books. And so uh, what we're going to do is unpack what's going on here, why is this so important, and what does it mean for us today? So let's start in the beginning. Uh, Jude begins with an introduction and a blessing. So he introduces who, he's, who he is. He says, I'm Jude, a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. His name is actually Judas. So if you're reading, uh, you know, go back to the original Greek, his name was Judas. And so he's saying, I am, my name's Judas, but the translators gave him a nickname Jude for obvious reasons so that there wouldn't be any confusion. And even as Jude or Judas is writing, he says, hey, this is Judas, servant of Jesus. Jesus. No, not that Judas, the other Judas, James's brother, Mary's son. He's actually Jesus' half-brother, Judas, not that Judas. And so this is what he's saying. He's not trying to big note himself. <clears throat> if he's big noting himself, he might have said, hey, this is Judas, Jesus' little brother. You should listen to me. But no, he introduces himself as Jesus' servant and James's brother to identify who he is. Again, not that Judas, the other Judas. And then he blesses these people. It says, to those who are called, loved by God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you, my dear friends. He says who he's writing to, even you and me actually, to all who belong to the Lord. He's writing to us. He's writing to people in his own time, specific addressees, like people who needed to hear these words, people who he loved. You can hear the love he has for them right here at the beginning and then at the end, you hear the love that he has. And throughout the whole letter, you hear the serious tone that he has. You don't write seriously for things you don't care about. And he has a serious thing to say to people whom he loves. He says to, to them and to us, remember you are loved by God. Remember, you are loved and secure in God. And may peace and love be multiplied to you, my dear friends. What a beautiful way to start a letter. I bet when they first heard that, they thought, this is going to be a great letter. But then he goes on to say, man, I wanted to write a much longer letter to you. I love you. I wanted to write a long letter, but I heard about some concerning things that needed to be addressed now. And so here's my memo, here's my short letter to impress upon you the urgency of the matter at hand so you take it seriously and act on it. And I'll write you a bigger, flowery, beautiful letter later. It's basically what he says. And as we go through the letter, you see Jude has packed this short letter with beefy illustrations and meaning, meaning we could genuinely do 10-week series on one chapter, this one chapter. We've done, you know, eight and 10 week series on single chapters of the Bible before. This is one of those chapters we could do that. There, there are, <clears throat> like I was thinking about it, it's, um, I don't know if this was strategically done by the, the people who compiled the New Testament uh, in its order, but it's the second last book before the revelation of Jesus. And basically what Judas or Jude here does, again, not that Judas, he kind of goes through a bit of a, a sweeping history of the Jewish people uh, from the beginning, actually, uh, all the way through and even into the present time and uh, goes over a bunch of things and it will take a long, long time to unpack all of it. So we're trying to zero in on the central and main point that he's trying to make today. That's what we're doing. So what is the point? What did he write? Why was it so urgent? Why couldn't he? I mean, how long does it take you to write a long letter compared to a short letter? That's how urgent this thing is. It's like they've got to get this message now. And so he doesn't even wait to the end of the letter to mention it. He frames the whole letter with this one line where he says, I am appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. He says, you've received it. You have the love and security of God and may grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's how he starts. And he says, but you've got to contend for it. 
And then he goes on to say what's happening to prompt him to, prompt him to make such a statement so urgently. He says, verse 4, because or for some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. This is basically the, the key part of his contention with the people he's writing to. They've allowed people to come into their communities who say they love Jesus, but with their lives display, proudly display, that Jesus isn't their Lord and he's not their saviour. This has been happening for a long time. It's still happening today. I think it's one of the reasons that Jude can so confidently say to everyone who is loved by God, because this letter will be relevant for God's people until Jesus comes back again. Got to be on the watch for people who sneakily, stealthily come into the church. It's been happening for a while. The people in the time of Jude, all the way down to our time today, twisting the gospel in ways that demote or deny Jesus, replacing him with their own ideas. Specifically in this case, Jude is talking about people who turn the grace of God into license for sensuality. So Paul writes to the Romans, if you're doing, um, uh, if you're doing Bible in the year, uh, you'll have read this yesterday actually, Paul writes to the church in Rome, saying, can we now just go about sinning as we want so that grace can be more powerful? Do we go on sinning? We have grace and grace covers over all of our sin and grace is wonderful and glorious and grace and peace be multiplied to you. So then do we just go on sinning because we know if we sin more, then that means there's necessarily more grace and grace is glorious. So let's get all the grace we can by just going and doing whatever the heck we want. And Paul says, hell no. Your version probably says, by no means. That's a weak translation. But these false teachers, Jude's talking about, they're coming in saying, oh, you do you. You do you. Just, just follow your heart, actually. Why would God give you that desire unless it's a good one? Go for it. Love is love, after all. You deserve this, actually. You've been good to God. You've been a good disciple. You deserve it. Go for it. And they weren't necessarily saying it with their lips. Interestingly, Jude doesn't actually call out their false teaching so much as their character and their way of life that polluted the church. Like we've been talking about through, uh, like it's, it, it comes up a lot in these smaller books of the Bible we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> um, how you live shows what you believe. And so if you believe something, you will do that thing. You're sitting on chairs right now because you believe, you're putting into practice the belief that chair will hold, you, hold your weight, hold you up. If you didn't believe it, you wouldn't be sitting down or you'd be sitting down really tentatively because our actions follow our beliefs. All of these things these people are saying and living with their lives are all just variations on the original stealth false gospel, which was, did God really say? Did God really say that? It doesn't seem like something God would say. God is love after all. He wouldn't say something like that. Surely. Listen to me, not to God. I've got the real good news, not that backward, bigoted, Bible-believing gospel. Again, Jude doesn't zero in on their teaching so much as he zeroes in on their sinful way of life. And he says their preaching is really just a cover for their sin. Well, grace, grace. Grace covers it all. You go do you. Uh, God is love, obviously. And so whatever love means to you, that's what love is, and, and you deserve it, and you go for it. The preaching is just a cover for their sin. And then Jude shows them this isn't anything new. He says, hey, remember back when God saved his people out of Egypt, and then they rebelled against his order so that none of that generation made it to the promised land. Remember that? And God saved them and redeemed them, and then they rebelled. Remember that? And then none of them, they all underwent judgment and none of them went into the promised land. I guess, oh, remember, remember back in uh, you know, Genesis 6 or the book of Enoch, which you may not have ever heard of, but Jude, he refers to it. 
Because remember how there were those divine beings, uh, angels or celestial beings that are supposed to serve Yahweh in his rule and run of the earth, but instead went against God, God's order and took human wives? Remember them? They elevated their sexual desire above God's order, not just rejecting God's order, but abusing their authority to gratify their sexual desires. So remember those guys? They're now in chains, in gloomy darkness, waiting for the day of judgment. Because remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Who went against God's order, suffering the punishment of eternal fire? Again, man, so many things I would love to say about these things, which we just don't have time for today. Stick to the main point. Uh, in the previous case, celestial beings desiring sex with human beings. In this case, human beings desiring sex with celestial beings. Do you remember what happened to them? So these false teachers, they're sneaking into the church. They're just like those people. They're doing the same kinds of things as those people. And they're in the church. It says, verse 8, in the same way, these people relying on their dreams, so stuff that they come up with themselves, defile their flesh, reject authority, and slander glorious ones. So they're doing the same kinds of things that consistently throughout history and Scripture are shown to be against God, against His order, and ultimately and always lead to destruction and judgment. So they won't get away with it, but they're going to wreck a lot of lives along the way if you don't contend for the faith. Again, it's not so much what they're preaching, Jude calls out, it's how they live their lives that shows who their real God is. Declaring allegiance to Jesus, perhaps, but showing, living allegiance to the world and to their own lordship. Now, I'm, I'm going to sit in judgment over the Scriptures and pick and choose the ones that I think sound good to me or seem good to me or seem in the nature of God as I understand Him. I'm actually sitting in the seat of judgment over God and over His Scriptures. Not coming under submission to His lordship in line with His order. Uh, there's another example here uh, from a text, another text similar to the first century Jews, but again, not in the Bible. Um, and like Second Peter calls out false teachers, he says they're like animals operating according to their instinct, but not according to God's order and lordship. Uh, Jude inserts this part about Michael and the devil having an argument about Moses' body, which you might, you might be hearing for the very first time right now. I promise you this is in the Bible. And he goes, uh, he finishes this argument by saying, these people blaspheme anything they don't understand. They blaspheme the Spirit of God, His servants, His ways, His order, His lordship, His justice, anything they don't understand. And what they do understand, they understand like animals, just by instinct. And even this, uh, this will lead to their destruction. Because even their instinct is against God and His ways. Then he's got this rapid fire run through the Old Testament, through the Torah, the Psalms, the prophets, and even Jesus' teaching, showing how these false teachers echo those who've come before, like waterless clouds. Oh, yay, rain's coming. Nope, no rain. Looks good, but it's a trick. They are stealthily coming in, looking great, and then not just leading to their own destruction, but taking others with them, unless we contend for the faith. That's what he says about it. He says, woe to them. They've gone the way of Cain. They've plunged into Balaam's era for profit. They've perished in Korah's rebellion. All stories that would have been very familiar to Jude's original addressees and hearers. You may be familiar with some of these as well. These people are dangerous reefs that you love feasts as they eat with you without reverence. Shepherds who only look after themselves. Again, all of these Lions might be reminding you of Old Testament stories. They're wild waves of the sea, or Psalms, foaming up, the shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. It was about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, look, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts they've done in an ungodly way concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. So again, 
they have weaseled their way, snuck their way into Christian community because the Christians heard what they were saying with their mouths, yes, Jesus is Lord, and did not correct, rebuke, or even started to join them in their lives, echoing not and, and not being obedient with God's order and commands, but rather with their own instinct and their own ways. It says people are discontented grumblers, living according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. He's got very harsh words to say about these people. He's kind of picking, he's picking all of the Old Testament, like, uh, like the, the, not the honor roll, like the dishonor roll of the Old Testament. And going, these people are like those people. Stop listening to them. Stop following them. Because we've seen every single time it leads to destruction. Every single time. There's, there is no rebelling against God that leads to overcoming the creator God who breathes and galaxies come into existence. There's no overcoming that. And he's not just mighty and not just powerful. He's loving and merciful. So after he gives this broad range of examples of these kinds of people throughout history, now he said, why we who belong to Jesus must contend for the faith. Uh, He finishes with a couple of but you's. It's like these people are like Cain. These people are like the ones who died in Korah's rebellion. These people are like animals just going on their base instincts. But you, he says, but you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time, he's quoting now, he's, they told you in the end time, there'll be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. It's from Second Peter. These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the spirit. So he says, don't be like those people, but you, or they, you know, these people are going to, just, to death and destruction and bring in lots of people with them, but you, remember. Don't be surprised when people come preaching another gospel. Jesus told us this would happen. Don't be surprised when people scoff. The apostles told us this would happen. Jesus too. Don't be surprised when people live according to their own ungodly desires. Jesus told us this would happen. Don't be surprised when people create divisions for their own pride and glory, for their own power, for their own purposes, for their own preferences, for their own platform, for their own pockets. Jesus and the apostles told us this would happen. Remember, we were told this was going to happen. doesn't make it less grievous when it happens, but it helps us to be ready when it happens and it helps us to identify people who claim allegiance to Jesus but do not have the Spirit, Jude says, and don't know God. What are we to do? I think the first thing we need to do is ensure we are not one of those kinds of people. Like Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? The people who fail the test, they need the gospel. They need to hear the truth of Jesus and his love for them, his saving work. Their actions need rebuking and their ideas need to be contended with. So people who are a law unto themselves need the gospel. They need the good news. Their sin needs rebuking if they claim to be in Christ. And their ideas need to be contended with. They can't go unchallenged because if truth goes unchallenged, we've seen this actually in Titus, it takes other people down with it. He gives a second but you. But you, dear friends, again, don't be like, people who are law unto themselves. Don't be like people who just, according to my own understanding, my best guess, this is what I think things should be like, and now I sit in the seat of judgment over God and His Scriptures. It says, by you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver, 
Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So again, he says, but you, firstly, remember. We were told all of this was going to happen. Remember. And secondly, but you, build yourselves up in the faith. How will you not be a person who just operates under your own understanding? Just build yourself up in the faith. How will you be a person not lured away by somebody else's life who says, yeah, I belong to Jesus and I can do whatever I want to do? Build yourself up in the faith. Don't let the deceitfulness of your own flesh or somebody else's sneaky words seduce you into thinking your actions don't matter. It says grow in your trust and allegiance to Jesus. Trust in and allegiance to Jesus. Secondly, it says pray in the Spirit. Not like vain wishes into the air, but weak words spoken to a powerful God. You don't need power prayers. We have a powerful God. Like we saw when we did spend, you know, 10 weeks going through one chapter, Romans 8, we saw when we give our weak words, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf and presents them to the Father as we should have said them. And so pray in the Spirit. Next, keep yourselves in the love of God. Don't go chasing other loves. Don't make the mistakes of those examples that he pulls from the Old Testament of people who elevated their own desires above the desire for the love of God. Next, wait expectantly for mercy from Jesus for eternal life. So even when it's hard, even when the wait seems long, even when things don't seem fair or aren't fair or have been terrible. He says, that doesn't last forever. He doesn't say, don't do something about it now. He says, the greatest mercy is from Jesus. The mercy is assured. When he comes again, he's bringing eternal life, or life eternal with him. Next he says, give mercy to those weaker than you, but no mercy to the sin that would kill them. So mercy on a little bit of sin leads to mercy on a lot of sin, leads to the urgent situation in the church that Jude is writing about in this letter. People need mercy. I need mercy. We need mercy. I mean, really desperately all the time. Uh, certainly from uh, our godly perspective, like our holiness perspective, we, without Jesus, desperately need mercy. And he gives us mercy. And so we need to give or extend mercy to others. We have to. We can't not give mercy because we've been given mercy. We can't not forgive because we've been forgiven. We can't not extend mercy because we have been extended mercy. But sin doesn't need mercy. Sin doesn't get mercy. Sin needs rebuking, correction. Sin is a cancer that will kill the person who coddles it and the community that coddles it. Mercy on sinners, rebuke and correction on sin. Jesus died because of our sin so that our sin would die with him. We don't want to go and pick that up again. Sin is for killing, not for coddling. And then he says, and save others by snatching them from the fire. So don't stand back as a brother or a sister runs into a fire but go before they get there and snatch them out of the fire. So he's saying there are no passive brothers or sisters. There's no passively contending for the faith. There is active contending for the faith. That's an active kind of mercy to run and save someone's life from the fire. How how dare we sit back and say, well, that's their choice. A little bit of sin. We have instructions for how to deal with that in terms of you know, once and twice and three times and uh, escalating and things like this. But he says, man, we are beholden to one another. We're members of one another. We need to have mercy on one another. Not to say, oh, I deserve it so I can go sin and not to say, oh, they deserve it because of their action or inaction. But rather we would step in and say, hey, I love you you are running towards the fire. 
He says, contend for the faith. Not just leaders in the church, not just elders, although certainly elders, it's certainly leaders, but all of us. All of us need to grow up in the faith. All of us need to pray in the spirit. All of us need to reject and kill and put to death the flesh and the things of the flesh. All of us need mercy and need to give mercy. All of us, I mean, we need to keep ourselves in the love of God. Have to. So the, life is only found there. We need to wait expectantly for mercy from Jesus for eternal life. And we all need to actively be snatching brothers and sisters from the fire. Again, loving, merciful uh, towards the person and correction, rebuke, death to the sin. And last he finishes this letter with a benediction. Uh, I grew up actually singing this uh, in church. You may have too. I heard it's from the 70s, so we're not going to sing it today. <laughs> it says, now to him. Man, it's, be- oh, it's beautiful though. Hear the, hear the power of this. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. You know, uh, sin cannot stand in the presence of God. There's another in a long list of reasons we want to kill and get rid of sin and not play with it, not cuddle it, not coddle it, uh, not get cute with it, but kill it because sin cannot stand in the presence of God. But God has washed us clean so that we can stand in his presence without blemish and with great joy. It says, To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. We have a really wonderful God, really powerful God, really loving God. He, like all the stories you heard are true, He he loves us and He saved us. Jesus came and did everything necessary for us to be washed white as snow, absolutely clean, no stain remaining. No shame remaining on us. Every blemish gone. In the sight of God, perfection as he looks at you because we're in Christ. And when Jesus comes, again, eternal life forever in the presence of God the Father because we have no spot, no blemish because we're in Christ. So we don't want to play cute with sin, please. And those who, uh, man, there are lots of people around the world, lots of people in our city. Uh, you hear stories about, oh, I hear stories about this all the time. I'm in church leadership, so, you know, I'm attuned to these stories of church leaders who are still doing these exact kinds of things and getting found out. But, man, there are so many who do not get found out or who just, you know, move state to state or rebrand or go somewhere else. I don't, man, I had someone I counted as a friend who even in our city did something exactly like this. So he moved to another country and became a pastor again. Same thing happened again. Can't play cute with sin. It's not, not only is it not worth it, it doesn't bring God glory. And so we need to be those who are built up in the faith and contend for it. That's the key message of Jude. I mean, if you want to get stuck into it, man, there's, there is a lot in there and stuff I wish we could go into detail in because it's super, super interesting uh, and, and may you know, even expand your perspective on God and judgment and the nature of hell and the nature of you know, angels and whatnot. It's all in there. But for today, let's contend for the faith. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us in Christ. We don't deserve any of this. We deserve to be among those who live according to their own desires, who are rebellious, who don't have their allegiance to you, but are under your judgment, waiting for the day of judgment. But because of your kindness and your mercy, because of your great love to us, because of your grace, your wondrous love. 
You've saved us, came for us, redeemed us. You're the one who in your mercy snatched us from the fire. And Father, we thank you. We praise you. You are the one who's able to keep us from falling. You're the one who uh, will have us stand in your presence pure and spotless without blemish, with great joy. And so today we say to you, our Saviour, glory and majesty, power and authority before all time, certainly now and for forever.